This is the Elite Entrepreneurs Podcast, where we teach you the proven methods to grow your seven-figure business to 10 million and beyond. Please welcome your host, Brett Gilliland. Welcome everyone to this week's episode of the Elite Entrepreneurs Podcast. I always have the privilege of introducing amazing people on this show. Um, it, it just boggles my mind consistently how many great people we have that'll come and share their real insights from their real experience. And today is no exception whatsoever. Today, I'm, I'm really pleased to be able to introduce somebody that I've known for several years. In fact, he just came and, and did us the honor of, of speaking at one of our recent elite events. His name is Sean Gagnon. He is co-founder and CEO of The Abs Company. And I would love for him to tell you a little bit more about The Abs Company before we dive into the episode. But let me say before he does, um, just how, how amazingly genuine a human being he is. Uh, it, it's not even a a thought when I asked him to come be on this show, he said, yeah, absolutely, I'll do that. And he just always giving, always sharing, has great insights. So I'm thrilled to share Sean Gagnon with all of you today. So welcome today, Sean, to the show. Thank you very much, Brett. Appreciate the kind words and the introduction. You know, I think at the end of it all, if somebody can say a few kind words about you, and they reflect the way that you tried to live your life, then you did okay. So genuine is a word that I, I tried to live by for sure. So I appreciate you saying that. Yeah, well, you are doing it. You're doing okay, my friend. It's fun to see you doing it. So, so tell everybody a little bit about the abs company. It'll be better coming from you than from me. And then we'll jump into some of your lessons learned as you've been growing your company. Yeah, sure. So, so the abs company is a fitness company. And we are on the equipment side of the industry. So there's a lot of areas in fitness, but we started, we were in the, on the health club side where we actually owned and operated health clubs. And then through some zigs and zags, we were able to get into the supply side of the industry, which I personally enjoyed much better because there's a lot bigger opportunity there. Um, allows you to be truly global if that's what you choose. And, and we are, we do business in 68 countries around the world. And it's also really neat to see that creations that you've either developed, created yourself or acquired, be able to bring those to the market. So we have um, nearly 50 worldwide patents on products that we have created or brought to the market. And our niche is in three key areas of fitness. So obviously abs, hence the name of our company. That's where we started. Uh, always an evergreen area of fitness. But we've also branched into HIT or high intensity interval training type products and now glutes, which is a tremendous um, trend in the industry. So we try to focus on areas that are hot in the industry, follow those trends and put our spin on them with unique products. So we don't bring out what we like to call me too products that anybody can make. So anything that we have is proprietary to us. And that's why we've been able to have the longevity that we've had. We've been doing this for over 25 years. Uh, in the industry. Uh, the abs company has been around for 16, but we had other operations before that that paved the way. And um, now our products uh, can be found in anywhere where you can find fitness. So we have sell direct to the consumer for their homes. We started in the TV infomercial side of the industry, but we also sell to health clubs, military, university, and as I said, all over the world. And the great thing is that the products that we create, we try to make them super intuitive so that anybody can use them, whether you are a true beginner or you are an elite athlete, Navy SEAL, so on down the road, because we believe in the fact that fitness truly does change people's lives. And we want to be able to, to be a part of that journey for people. Thank you for teeing that up for us. Um, I want to challenge our listeners the next time they're at the gym or they're working at home on their abs or doing high intensity interval training, or they're working on their glutes, Whatever products you're using, there's a pretty good chance that they're coming across something from the abs company. So take a look. Might be one of those nearly 50 products that you guys have put out. Uh, and six, did you say 68 countries? 68 countries, yeah. yeah. That's fantastic. Well, you guys are having a big impact in the world. And uh, now what I want to do is transition to sharing some of your insights that can have a different kind of impact 
with our listeners than just their physical health. Uh, there's a there's a, a leadership health game that we're all involved in as seven figure business owners, and we need we need ideas, we need products, if you will, that can help us figure out that that journey that we're all on. So if you think back to when you were in that lower seven figure range and you were just moving past that, or you're in that transition from scrappy founder entrepreneur to capable business building CEO, there's a, there's a transition from learning and doing to leading and leading others, excuse me, leading leaders even. And, and a lot of business owners get stuck there. So I don't want to direct this too much, Sean, but if you think back to some of your early growing lessons, your own leadership lessons, what are some of the things that stand out to you as, as key growth moments for you? Yeah, I mean, there, there's so, so, so many. I'll try to pick out a few that are, that are relevant. But one thing I'll say before I do that is, you know, you, you mentioned transitioning from the scrappy founder entrepreneur into the CEO and business builder. One of the things I've always tried to do, because I think it is my DNA, is to remain a scrappy entrepreneur because we have to be. No matter what level of entrepreneurship you're in, there's always somebody bigger. There's always somebody with more resources. And being that scrappy entrepreneur allows you to be nimble. And that's one of the lessons that I've really learned is to move at speed. You know, back when I was starting out, I, I tended probably like a lot of early stage entrepreneurs to overthink everything. And you, you, you say, okay, well, is this the right move? Or what if it doesn't work? Or what happens if? And so on and so forth. And you get stuck. And I, I came up with a framework that we use at the ABS company. I call it TPE. And that stands for think, plan, execute. And the think part actually came from working with you and your organization with Tyler Norton. He gave a whole talk about thinking, right? Actually made t-shirts that said think. And his, his contention, I think it came from his father uh, back in the early days, was most people don't spend enough time thinking. And, and I, that really resonated with me because I think sometimes as an entrepreneur, someone who's willing to jump into this game wants to do right? They want to be a doer. So they, they kind of just jump in to execute. But if you execute before you really have a plan, there's going to be problems. Sometimes you can get lucky. You could, you could hit one out of the park, but that doesn't mean you're successful. But even before planning, you have to think. And what I mean by that is you got to take time to not really figure out what all the steps are, but just to think about what it is you're actually trying to achieve. And a lot of people, I think, miss that step. I missed it for years because you jump right to the very end and you say, OK, well, we want to be successful. Or we want to have this much revenue. But is that really what you're trying to achieve? Or are you trying to achieve some form of sustainability, some form of impact within your industry, which will lead to that ultimate success. So I think the thinking part is really important. It's something that I had to learn because myself and probably a lot of others can relate to this. If we're not doing, sometimes we think that we're, we're being lazy, right? We're just kind of sitting around. We're not actually taking action. And I had to learn that. And I had to be able to stop, get away, and sometimes remove myself from the environment. One of the things I learned is that success is part mental and part environmental. And if you can just change your environment, then sometimes it allows your mind to expand. And the key thing that I learned on Think was this, this simple start to a question. How do I? How do I? And as soon as we ask, how do I, your mind opens up, right? Not, we're going to do this. Okay, well, that's not really thinking. How do I says, wait a minute, what if it's this? Or what if it's that? Or what if it's this? What are all the angles that you can go to? So that's really step one. Then once you have the all the how do I thoughts, you have to start to eliminate them because you can't do everything. And that's another area where entrepreneurs get stuck. They try to do everything, the shiny object syndrome, right? I'm going to go here. I'm going to go there. I'm going to go, oh, wait, about, what about this? What about this, right? The whatabouts, I call those, right? And the whatabouts are good. You have to say, well, what about this? Because it brings you back to thinking, but you can't follow them all. So you have to now eliminate the things that you've thought about and you actually have to sit down and make a plan. And this is the next area where I and many entrepreneurs get stuck because you get nervous. You worry that your plan is not the right one. And it very well may not be. But if you only stay in the planning phase and you never jump to execution, you're not going to know. So you have to be willing 
to have the courage to step into execution on the plan that you came up with through the thought. So that's our process here at the Apps Company. And it took me a long time to learn that. But if you come to my business and ask anybody what TPE means, they know, think, plan, execute. And when sometimes we start to move too fast or too slow, we say, where are we getting stuck, right? Are we overthinking? Did we not come up with a plan there? Did we forget to execute on the plan that we came up with? So I like things, as I said in the talk at Elite, I like things that are simple frameworks that we can remember because I do believe that great leaders don't always try to find something new to say. They find the things that work and they say them again and again and again and again. And TPE is one of the things that really helped me. And an area I have to say, honestly, I really got stuck in. And if I'm being completely honest, the area that I got stuck in the most was the thinking. I was pretty good at the plan, right? I could come up with a plan and I was pretty good at jumping into execution. I wasn't really scared at that phase, but I didn't in the early days take enough time to just stop and do the thinking. So that's that's probably the number one uh, tip that I would share of those phases. Go through that and and then and then watch what happens to your levels of execution. That, that's a great simple framework. I appreciate you sharing that. Uh, I want to go back to something you said if, as you were sharing that that you were one of these guys like if I wasn't going, I thought I was being lazy. Like I wasn't working hard enough. I might be putting words in your mouth, but the how do you how do you take somebody who's so driven, so wired to be on the go and slow down enough to think, which feels at first like an unproductive activity, right? So what did you have to do to actually say no to all the noise, all the there's all stuff, there's all these things coming at you, and you had to either slow that down or just stop it long enough to think. Was, is there something you did to build that into your, your weekly rhythm? Like, what did you do to think? It was, and it's a, and it's a great question. And I, I go back to, I, I'm a, I, I get a lot of influence from Tony Robbins, who's one of the guys that I, that I listen to a lot through the, for over, probably over 30 years, I've listened to his materials and stuff. And one of the things he says is, if you want to change your life, change your questions, right? Ask better questions. And the question that I learned to ask myself was very simple. Is, How's that going for you? Right. So I would look at the things that I was doing and I would have to ask myself, oh, how's that going for you? Right. Because just like you said, and you didn't you did not put words in my mouth. I did feel lazy if I wasn't doing if I was just sitting and thinking. But on the other side of that equation is sometimes we just are doing too much and we're not taking the time to actually measure the result of the work that we're doing. It's very easy to be busy, but it's much more difficult to be effective what you're doing and you have to measure those results so to get if you're somebody who's struggling with sitting down and actually thinking take a look at your entire ecosystem and ask yourself that question how's it going for you right that very question alone will force you to stop and it will force you to then think about all the things that you are doing and the ways that you're analyzing the ways in which you're doing things and one of the things that i had to learn also in those early days is to become more much more data driven in mm -hmm. what I was doing, because you can get a feel for things. You ask most people, how's it going? Going good, right? But a seasoned entrepreneur, a true leader is going to say, well, explain that to me. Like, how is it really going? Give me some numbers around that or, or give me some statistics about how that social is going or, or what happened when we put out this blog or so forth. And it gets you to go deeper. I had the, the just the other day, I had the experience with a friend of mine who's built a very, very large company in our industry. And he said, what's your mid-year EBITDA? And I'm like, Huh? <laughs> and I was like, oh boy. Well, I said, and I, and I tried to get off the hook saying, well, it's, you know, it's not the end of June yet. We're not mid year. He's like, come on, you got to know by this point. Right. But it forced you to stop and think about what you're doing, because even today, man, you can just keep trying to go that million miles a minute, but asking that simple question, how's that going for you? Caused me to slow down. And the other thing, like I said, is, and I believe this is really important about success being part environmental. And a lot of people will tell you about it's who you hang out with. And I believe all of that, right? You got to be in the right circles, which is Again, why I grew up so much being a part of elite entrepreneurs in my journey, because you were around the right minded people, but it's also your physical environment and you have to take that time. I, I travel a lot because I am, you know, as I said, we do business all over the world. And in the early days of my career, I would go where I was going, do what I had to do and I would leave. Right. And there's a time for that. And I'm not suggesting that we become business tourists where we stay and just do it. But I have learned 
So let me get there one day early. Maybe let me stay one extra day after the trade show. Is there decompress and do what? Think about, okay, how did that go? How could I do it better? What did I miss? Because if you just leave wherever you are in my world and you go to the next thing, did you really go back and analyze what actually happened? So that, those are kind of the, the tips I would give in that area. Great tips. What would you say to somebody? Because I, I hear some version of this all the time. They have, they have a good idea or they have an intent. I'll call it intent. I intend to start spending more time thinking. I'm going to do, I like what Sean said. I'm going to do more thinking. And then the, they say, they follow that up with something like, as soon as this big project is done, or as soon as I get through this season, or as soon as I get this other thing out of the way, then I'll start doing that thing that'll make me more effective. Understanding that there are realities, right? There are those times in our lives where it, it is busy. It's first thing, wake up all the way to the end of the day and I'm slammed. But what would you say to somebody who has good intents or ideas or desires to change, but then find themselves saying, I'll get to that after. And then and they just get stuck in the perpetual loop of being busy. Yeah, great question. Uh, I don't believe in intention. I really don't. Some people will tell you intention matters. I don't believe that it does. I believe that commitment matters because we don't get our goals, we get our standards, period, end of story. Because exactly what you just said, if you intend to do something, you will, can allow a million other things. One of the, I like to, I'm from New Jersey, right, originally. And in New Jersey, we have the Jersey Turnpike, got all these roads, right? And we have, as every highway does, we have these off ramps, right? If you're from New Jersey, people say, what exit, right? What exit are you from, right? So it's a Jersey joke, but what off ramp is what they're saying. Well, the same thing is true in leadership, business and success. There's a million off ramps that you can take. And if your intention is to get from A to B, but oh, that looks interesting over there, or oh, this is coming, I'll just take the off ramp and now I'm off course. But if I'm committed to get to B, now that's a different story. Because one of the things I teach myself every day and my team is never negotiate with yourself. Once you've made a commitment to something, that's it. Because your super conscious mind is a very powerful thing. Mm -hmm. And if you say, we're gonna do this, and then you start to take those off ramps because of your intentions got interrupted, super conscious mind says, oh, when this guy or girl says something, they don't really mean it, so don't worry about it, right? But me, when I say something, I do it. People ask me, I was talking to some people at, at, at the event last week, we were talking about working out and training. My alarm goes off at 4.30 every morning. That's when I get up to train. People are like, do you like doing that? And I say, there was never a day in my life that that alarm went off. I'm like, awesome, let's go. But I do it. I get up and I go train because I've made that commitment to myself. And the same has to be true in your, in this example, your commitment to spending time to think. Some people say, build it into your calendar. Great idea, right? Monday is between three and five is my thinking time. Great. Don't let anything interrupt that. Just like you wouldn't let anything interrupt your leadership meeting or your, uh, you know, go, you have a meeting with your attorneys, whatever it is, your key customer, you're not going to let something interrupt that because you made a commitment. You can't negotiate with yourself and give up on the commitments or you're never going to accomplish anything. So that's what I'd say. Forget intentions, right? Oh, well, all intentions are all good. Not in my world. I don't believe it. I believe that what you commit to is what you're actually going to ultimately get. What a great example of being your word, right? I, I've known any, any real successful people by my definition have mastered that part of their life, being their word, total yes. commitment, no negotiation, no someday I will, like I'm either on that path or I'm not gonna do it. But yeah, intentions versus commitment, love it, thank you. What else? I, I, I prompted you with some questions, but, but let's get off of my questions now and just be broader. What are, what are one or two of those things that you could only learn by going through that growth process for yourself and your business, but have at the, it's really shaped who you've become as a leader? Yeah, I think the first thing you really have to, to understand is how hard it's going to be. And especially in today's day and age where in the age of social media, everybody's showing you the highlight whether it be in fitness and relationships and business, whatever you go in, there's very few people that are giving you that real look behind the curtain. But what's interesting is the couple people that, and I say couple as a representation of how many profiles are who've had the courage to do that, do really well. 
because they resonate with what's really going on in people's lives. And I think when it comes to entrepreneurship, there's a lot of people out there selling a book and selling a course, but they've never actually built anything. And that's, again, is why I love being a part of the elite community. These were people in there and still to this day in there who are building real businesses, you know, and you in, in your background and experience, you came to us and Clayton, and all the guys, when I learned that story, that these guys sat around a, a table with cereal and all this stuff, and they, they, they concocted this idea for this, this business and grew it into a massive business. I said, that's the people I want to be around because they know how hard it's going to be. And I really learned a lot by hearing, okay, these are the sticking points. Like you just said, what happens at that one, two million phase and three and five and 10, whatever it is, it's hard, man. And a lot of people aren't built for it. Some people say entrepreneurship is for everybody. I say it's not. You have to be willing to go through it. And that's okay, right? Some people make a great number too. Anybody who's a CEO needs great people around them. There's nothing wrong with that, right? And maybe you work yourself into an equity position and you can call yourself an entrepreneur, whatever it is. You don't have to start the business to be an entrepreneur because ultimately at the end of the day, you are an entrepreneur of yourself. Some people call it an intrapreneur, right? You're working inside the business. You still have to lead and manage yourself, but that's probably the key lesson. It is hard. And I don't care if you're at, 100,000 a year or 100 million a year, there's just very different challenges that you're going to be going through. And you have to be willing to take those hits. But what you have to remember is the good book says, this too shall pass. Even though you are going through that hard time, if you just keep going, the sun is going to come up tomorrow and you're going to find a way through it. We saw that during the last couple of years where a lot of businesses just shuttered, right? And yeah, a lot of it, there was economic implications, everything that was going on. But I also believe that a lot of people just gave up, man, because there were a lot of resources that were out there. In my industry, in America alone, 25% of health clubs shut their doors never to reopen again. Right? That's a huge part of my business in there. But what are we going to do? Crawl under a rock? You got to keep going. This is, again, after all these years, you keep taking the hits, keep taking the hits, keep taking the hits. But the more hits you take, you realize the hits aren't really that bad. You know, there hasn't been one in 25 years that sunk this ship. And I don't know what one would be because entrepreneurs find a way. So I think that's probably the key lesson that if you're going to go down this path, expect it to be hard and don't expect it to get easier just because your business is growing. You're just going to face all new challenges. But as you grow and as you get bigger, you need to bring in better and better people onto the team. And that's a mistake a lot of entrepreneurs make. They don't want to let go. They don't want to give up the control, as they like to say, in areas that I can do it better. And maybe it's true. Maybe it's true as, on the, as the entrepreneur, I can do every job individually better than the people around me. Well, I'd say work on your hiring a little bit, but also even if everybody on your team was doing it 80 to 90% as good as you think you can, imagine that momentum that starts to build. So that's really lesson two. You have to let, you have to let people do their job. You have to first have the courage to bring people onto the team, right? And a lot of entrepreneurs, and I made this mistake, I still make this mistake, you wait too long to bring people onto the team, right? Like, well, just like you said before, well, when we get to this point, that's when we're going to need them. You needed them before then, or you may never get to that point. So you have to have the courage to bring people on even a little bit early in the journey and let them grow into that position uh, that, 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 that you actually hired them for. And then you have to get out of their way. The great John Maxwell gave a, gave a simple framework that we use here at the Abs Company all the time. He calls it the 10-80-10 principle. And basically what that means, if you're not familiar, is that the first 10% of the work is really kind of goes back to that thinking and the planning, right? We get together and we really make sure everybody understands where we are and where we are trying to go and the steps to get there. Then the 80% is getting out of the way let them do their job, whoever it is that you hired. I don't believe in micromanaging people, but I do believe in micromanaging results. And that's where accountability comes in. During that 80%, when they're out there doing the work, you're not interrupting the process, but you are looking for updates. Hey, where are we with this, right? You want to frameworks you taught us, UAC, understanding, agreement, and commitment. Once we have that commitment of this is going to be done by then, get out of the way. Let them do what it is they've committed to actually doing. And then once they're done, you jump back in with the other 10%. We say, how can we make this 10% better, right? Because I believe, and this is something that the great uh, violinist Roddy Chung, if you ever heard of him, he was part of the Trans-Siberian Orchestra. I heard him speak once. He said, there's 10% more in everything that we do. 
he was teaching us just to stretch. He goes, I bet you can stretch just 10% higher in that. He said the same is true in business and in life. There's always another 10%. And you've gotten out of people's way. You've allowed them to do their work, the 80, work that they're probably proud of. They're bringing you their best work. But then they have to have the humility to allow us to step back in as leaders and say, I bet you there's 10% more we can do. Let's take a look at it. And that's how you create world-class results. And it's something I really had to learn because in the early days of hiring people, A, like I said, I didn't hire soon enough for a lot of people, but then I would be kind of sitting there watching them do what it is that I hired them to do. And if that's what I was doing, then why hire them in the first place? Just continue to do it all yourself, but you'll never grow that way. So I think those are two of the key areas. Number one is that it's, it's gonna be harder than you think, and it really doesn't get easier, right? So you have to be willing to do that, you have to be willing to sacrifice for the results that you want. And then you have to surround yourself with great people. And when you do, just get out of the way. That's how you stop being the bottleneck in your organization. Well, I, I wanna follow up with one question. I, I'm sitting here thinking, man, I have, I could talk to you for hours about this stuff um, if it were practical for a podcast episode, but one of the, you just talked about hiring great people. I happen to know that you have people that have been with you a long time. You mentioned this business being around 25 years. Uh, I know you have at least one team member who's been with you more than 20 years. Yep. So not only have you hired great people and gotten out of the way, but somehow you've created a place that they want to be part of. Somehow you've created a place where they enjoy being. Somehow you've created a place where they're sticking around for 20 plus years. Talk, talk to us just... I mean, as, as small and impactful as you can here, talk to us about keys to creating a great place where people can thrive, not just getting out of their way, but what, what do you do to invest in them? What do you do to create an environment where they want to be and stay? Yeah, and it's culture. At the end of the day, it's culture. And, you know, you and I have spoken at this any many, many times. We could talk about it many, many more times. I learned a lot of what I know about culture from you and all the great folks at Elite, but culture is what, what attracts people to your organization, right? I've talked about um, vibrational frequency. A lot of people like, oh, what is that? But we know what it is because the root of that is vibe, right? It's vibe. And you'll say, oh, oh, there's a great new restaurant. What's the vibe like, right? Or I'm going to a party or meeting these new people. What's the vibe like with that group, right? That's really what they're saying is what's the vibrational frequency of it? We all give that off in the world. And our vibrational frequency either attracts people and things to us or repels them from us. And in my organization, the, the vibe, which is the culture, is rooted in gratitude, hands down. And if you are someone who is not a grateful person in your spirit, you're not going to last with us. And we're just not going to do well together because the opposite of that is the entitled person. So it, it's, it's creating an, a, a culture where people are attracted to it. Because if the culture that you've created does not attract the right people who are aligned with it, their own personal cultures will ultimately override the organization's cultures. And that's a recipe for disaster. And I had to learn that too, because you, a lot of times, and this is not unique to my company, every company in the world has gone through this. You find that person who's a star performer and you think that that is strong enough to allow them to not be a cultural fit for your organization. And it is not. And they also, the converse is also true. I've had people that were certainly aligned with some of our values, whether it be gratitude or leadership or big thinking, but our last core value is win, right? You have to produce result. And sometimes you give people a pass because, you know, as a sports analogy, they're a great locker room guy or girl, right? You want them around. But in growing organizations, you really can't have those people. You can get to a certain point where not everybody's that A-plus player. You need some Bs and Cs to, to do the work, and that's okay. But ultimately, even in their B and C, they have to be winning, right? Whatever their task is, they have to be winning. So the reason I believe people not only have stuck with me that long, but have now brought their family members to work for us. You were referencing Kim earlier. Her son now is one of my key salespeople. I mentioned at the talk that my marketing director, Cindy, has two of her sons working for us now and because they see the culture. And one of the things I really had to learn in, in my journey uh, in creating a, goal, a great culture is to actually spend time with your people, more time. Just like you have to commit to the thinking part of growing your business, you have to commit to the time part of strengthening your culture 
and learning what really makes your people tick because you're not going to know truly if they are a cultural fit if you don't spend time with them. I mentioned uh, in the talk that there's a great book called The Attributes by a Navy SEAL with the by the name of Rick Devini. And one of the things, statements he made in that book is time is the currency of leadership. Mm -hmm. And it's so true. And as busy entrepreneurs, CEOs, or, or top leaders in an organization, sometimes you're, you're just so busy that we push time with our people to the back burner. And even in a remote world, many organizations today are remote. And how do you spend time with your people? You have to commit to it, right? Because there's an energy transfer that happens when people are together. And the greatest energy transfer is when people are one-on-one -on -one together. And then the next level would be small group together. But after that, it goes one-on-one -on, -one on a Zoom. Don't always have just group Zoom meetings. Do one-on-one -on -one Zooms if you have a remote culture. And then the last stage is getting the group together as a collective because a lot of great things happen there too. But, but the, the key to, to great hiring and keeping people around is creating a culture that they want to be a part of and that aligns with their own personal values. And the last thing I'll say about this is I had to learn a couple of key phrases. And, and you know, I'm a parent of, of three, and I, I, I try to use this both at home and at work. And I had to learn this because it's not in my nature to be overly complimentary. I'm, a, I'm a, a hard charger in a lot of areas, and I believe that results matter in the world, and, and they do. But the, the key phrases that I had to learn is that when, when somebody is doing well, or they've accomplished something great, you must say these words to them. I am proud of you. It's one of the things we long to hear as human beings, right? Whether it be from our parents, our spouse, right? When's the last time you told your spouse, I'm proud of you, right? When's the last time you told your kids, I'm proud of you. But the other side of that coin is also as powerful. And that is when somebody is not doing well. They're not meeting standard. That's a time when we can often come down on people, but that's the wrong time to come down on people and actually try to push them harder. When somebody is not doing well, of course we address that, but we have to leave that conversation with, I believe in you. Because once somebody knows that you as the leader, the spouse, the parent, the friend, believe in them, that gives them an energy like no other. And when they actually accomplish, you follow that up with I am proud of you, and you will see this flywheel begin to turn faster and faster and faster. Those two simple phrases, can change everything. And I had to learn that in my journey, but I try to use those a lot now in my organization because most of us as leaders and trying to accomplish, we get it backwards, right? When things are going well, we is the time when we over celebrate on things, right? And there's a time for that. And you have to tell people that you're proud of them, but that's also a time when you can push them because they're high already. And when things aren't going well, most leaders tend to come down on people. But that's the time when you need to lift people up. You need to put your arm around them and tell them that you believe in them and watch what happens. So that would be my answer to how do you create hires that want to stick with you? A, make sure they personally align with the values of your organization. If they don't, you got to let them go regardless of the result. And number two, make sure your people know that you are proud of them when they win and that you believe in them when they don't. You, you saved the best for last, Sean. Uh, that was that was great. I. I was thinking about, just as you were saying, I was thinking about moments when somebody has been proud of me and, and moments when somebody's believed in me. And sometimes it feels like those can happen in, around the same situation or scenario, but how, how, how meaningful is it when you say, I'm proud of you to somebody who you have previously said, I believe in you, like that sense of change, that sense of growth, that sense of development. And then on the flip side, to say, I believe in you, maybe when they're going through something hard, when before you've told them, I'm proud of you for something else, right? Like that, that combination is really powerful, whether whichever it leads out, right? And, and it's not always the same conversation. But anyway, just yeah, but the majority of people have will, will never believe in themselves if they don't feel that somebody else believes in them too. Right. Yeah. There's certain people who can, right? They can just be out there on the island. I have this, this iron will and they go out there and they just go, 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 whether somebody believes it or not. But most people in our charge are not that. And they yeah. need to know. They need to know because it's hard. It's what I said before. It's hard, especially if you're dealing with salespeople, right? Every day, man, hey, kick that teeth. No, 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 no. Right. Just gotta go, man. Just keep going, man. I believe in you. And they go and they get a little charge and then they get a win. Hey, I'm proud of you. So yes. watch the wheel turn. It's fun. What a, what it's a fun. virtuous cycle. Yeah. 
Well, Sean, this has been incredible. Thank you. I knew it would be, but I just appreciate your willingness to share the time that you've given. Uh, I want to have everyone listening understand the impact of creating a place where people can come, do great work, be inspired, be believed in. I have somebody tell them that they're proud of them. That's a different thing than just I'm doing a job. I'm punching a clock. And you create something special that people want to be part of for generations now. I didn't, I didn't realize you had a couple of team members who had, who had children there working at the apps company. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Sean, so much for being our guest today and sharing your experience with us. My pleasure. And, and as I've said many times, I attribute so much of my entrepre entrepreneurial journey to what I learned from you personally, Brett, and to all the great people at Elite uh, all those years ago. They stick with me and they always will. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm sure there will be people who want to look into the apps company or connect with you on social. What is the best way for people to, to check out the apps company or connect with you? Yeah. So on, on the web, the abscompany.com, all socials are at the abs company. And uh, you can find uh, me personally on LinkedIn at Sean Gagnon. Thank you, everybody, for listening to this episode. Please share it with as many seven figure business owners as possible. We want to help everyone who's making that journey, trying to figure it out uh, by putting them in front of these great guests that we're bringing, like Sean today. Uh, share, like, do all those things so that we can help as many people as possible. We'll see you next time. You've been listening to the Elite Entrepreneurs Podcast with your host, Brett Gillerlin. Be sure to leave a rating and review wherever you listen to your podcasts. You may also want to visit our website, EliteEntrepreneursPodcast.com, to find additional resources to grow your business from seven figures to 10 million and beyond.